Today's sermon's entitled, What Happens to Me When I Die? I know that death is not a subject we really like talking about. We don't like thinking about it. It wasn't that long ago I went to a funeral, and it was for a pastor's wife who had passed away, and it was for, I guess, the pastor and all of his friends and all of his colleagues, and you know what? It got me thinking about death, and the reality is is that death is is a transitioning phase from being in this world, in this is place, this place that's not our home, and going somewhere else, either heaven or hell. And I got thinking death is rushing towards us. It's inevitable. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. Whether we want to talk about it or not, whether we want to acknowledge that it exists or not, it still does. And we got to ask the question now, not later, because then it'll be too late. What is going to happen to me when I die? Now, the world would tell us, you know what? Don't worry about that. It doesn't really matter. The world actually is becoming more and more atheist all the time, according to studies. They don't believe God actually exists. So what they do believe is that once they die, they will be annihilated. In other words, they're going to cease to exist, and they're really not going to care. Therefore, they tell all of us, live any lifestyle that you feel like. You don't have to worry about living a good lifestyle. You don't have to acknowledge God. Just do whatever you want, because once you die, you cease to exist. But we know that's not true. Here's the reality. All of God's creation testifies to God's existence. That's the first thing. The second thing is God's holy word is available to us. We can read that and we understand from God's perspective what he says is we exist because of him and we exist to love him and to have a relationship with him. And if we choose not to have one, then we are going to be judged. And nobody likes to hear that word. Let's be honest. We like hearing the word grace, mercy, love. Those are the things that we like to share with the world. But when it comes to God's justice, we like to park that off on the side. We don't want to talk about that because that means God's going to decide whether we're in the right place or in the wrong place. We don't want to think about that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We still have to think about, have you made Jesus a Lord of your life? Time is running out. Both the young and the old die. And we see that in the newspapers all the time. If you turn on the TV, you can see that a lot of young people have died. And we always say way before their time. But that's the time that God gave them. And they passed away. Ready or not, we must be prepared to meet our creator. The question is, are you ready? God is going to judge you. Whether you feel God should or not. Whether you feel it's okay to talk about justice or not makes no difference. The Bible is abundantly clear here. God will judge you the moment that you die and place you either in heaven or hell. That's fact, and that's true. There's a story here, a parable. It's called The Rich Man and Lazarus, and I'm sure you're very aware of it. It's taken from Luke chapter 16, 19 to 31. It's an earthly story a parable is with heavenly meaning. Did it actually happen? It's a possibility when Jesus talks about this parable. Maybe the the two characters in the story, the rich man and Lazarus, maybe they actually existed. I believe they probably did. And the story is actually, uh, you know, a story that happened. But it makes no difference. Either way, Jesus liked to tell parables in order to tell heavenly truth. And that's what this parable is meant to do. There are two men. and, And Jesus contrasts their lifestyles and says they couldn't be any different. One man was rich. And one man was poor. Both of them had opposite lifestyles. One actually loved God and wanted to serve him and did his best to do so. And the other one completely ignored God. They had two deaths and two different destinations. And as we go through the parable, there's two things that you want to capture your attention. The first thing ultimately is, is that when we get rich, if you are rich and you got a lot of money, and I think all of us in North America have a lot of money, make sure you share with the poor. First, the parable is an indictment against those people who have lots and they don't share with other people. But the second part of the parable, and the more important part, I think, because it talks so much more about it, is a description of hell. It is a warning to each and every one of us. Time is running out, and you must choose God. If you don't choose him, then you automatically go to hell because you've chosen to say no to him. You will end up in the lake of fire. You'll end up with anguish, torture, and desperation as being your only friends. And that's where you'll end up at. The goal of this sermon is not to give you all the horrifying characteristics of hell to instill fear in you so bad that you go home and you shake. That's not necessarily the goal. I think we do need to fear God because that's the beginning of wisdom. But at the same time, the real goal of this sermon is to get you to ask the question, where are you going? Because you don't get to ask that question later. 
The moment that you die, your decision, either for God or against him, has already been made and can never be changed. And I want to tell you about hell. Now, you might say, Pastor, couldn't we not just focus on heaven more? Another sermon, I certainly will. This sermon, this parable, Jesus specifically deals with hell and spends most of his time describing hell. And I want to keep that perspective of that parable true. But before I begin... I think it's really important that I pray because this is one of those sermons that if you're listening and you're not sure whether you're going to heaven or hell, this is definitely a sermon you want to listen to because I guarantee you if you don't and you do end up going to hell for an eternity, you'll remember this sermon forever and ever and it will haunt you. And I don't want that. So let us pray. Lord, may you open their eyes that they might see, their ears that they might hear and their hearts that they might feel how urgent it truly is that each person listening make you the Lord of their lives before it's too late. Lord, as the horrifying realities of hell are described in great detail, may this not crush their souls and leave them with a sense of desperation, but instead may they rejoice in your love, compassion, and mercy. For each of your lost sheep, you have love, compassion, and mercy that has no limits. May they know no one is beyond redemption and the angels will rejoice this very day for anyone who is listening to this sermon who says, I want to know Jesus and I want to make him the Lord of my life. You will come into their hearts and they will become saved and they will rejoice and so will you. Since this may be the very last chance for those listening to ultimately say yes to you, Lord, with a sense of urgency and great humility. Give me your wisdom, your power, your love to tell them the truth, that by your grace and faith in you, they can choose their destiny to be heaven instead of hell. Amen and amen to that. May God bless the prayer. I got thinking about the destination of these two men. There was a rich man. Actually, the rich man was an indictment against the Pharisees. And if you go back a little bit in Luke, you find out he's actually talking about the parable of the shrewd manager. What people highly value, money, fame, power, glory on this earth, Jesus says to the Pharisees, those things that you covet the most, he says, those are detestable in God's sight, Luke 16, 15. So this is what he's trying to say to to all of these Pharisees that are out there. For all the people who really think they can chase after the things of this world and pretend they're godly, this is what he's saying. There was a rich man who lived absolutely like a king in every way, shape, and form. Every day he had clothing that was absolutely immaculate beyond all imagination. His robe was imported from Phoenician wool. It was dyed by hundreds of small little snails. Can you imagine getting catching all these snails, number one, and then dyeing his robes? You can only imagine how expensive they were. His garments were imported from Phoenician fine linen. It felt like silk against his body. He had a grand home that had a great big huge, it was a portico, but it was like a porch. It was similar to the temples and the palaces of the day. This is how rich this individual was. The indictment went against him, though. Likely, he got his riches through immoral means, most likely, because it refers back to the Pharisees. The indictment, it was, he didn't care for the poor. That was one of the indictments, especially a beggar that was at his gate. Invites any money listener, anybody who's listening to this, he doesn't give the rich man a name. Why? Because if you fit the bill of the rich man, and I want to invite you to think about this, then put your name in there, for you are the other participant in the story besides the beggar. You are that participant. There was a beggar. The beggar's name was Lazarus, which means God helps. The irony given his name, and and we listen to his name, God help me. And when you read over what this poor beggar went through, you realize he had the opposite of what the rich man had. He had a wretched, filthy, dirty life. He was poor beyond all imagination. Every day, the rich man's aroma, his perfume, would go by the beggar, and the beggar's stench would be real. And the rich man would look at him and say, you stink, you smell really bad. And the beggar would be looking at the rich man and say, you smell really good. I wish I had a piece of what you have. Society had no reason to love the beggar. He had no friends whatsoever. He had no life whatsoever at all according to our society standards. 
And to make it worse, he had physical ailments. He had sores all over his body. And back in those days, that meant you were unclean. You had an unclean status and everybody would stay away from you. It says in scriptures in the prodigal son, it says how the wayward son loved to eat the food of the pigs in chapter 15, verse 16 of Luke. And the beggar, he longed, how he longed to eat just a little crumb off the, his master's table. How he longed to grab a hold of the soap greased bread that the master was using as a napkin and say, can't you just give me a small little bite? And this beggar had no friends. His only companions were these pariah like wild dogs. And they would come and they would say, had so little regard for his life. He says in the scripture that they go and they'd lick his sores. Why? Because they valued his life absolutely not at all. And at this point in the story, we gotta ask, where's the justice here? Where is the justice? The rich man ate the most expensive food that you could find in all of Palestine. And the poor man was absolutely starving to death. So we got to ask the question, where is God's justice? Late antiquity, ultimately, would have said that if you live in luxury, then expect ruin. You would think the rich man would be thinking about this. All of scripture talks about how we're supposed to feed the poor. And this rich man was supposedly a son of Abraham. So this blind, this beggar, he's sitting there and he's saying, you know what? How come the rich man isn't taking care of me? How come he isn't listening to the scripture? But he wasn't. There couldn't be any more disparity between the rich man and the beggar. There couldn't be more. And one's left wondering at this point in the parable, where is the justice? Where? parable goes on and says this, The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side and the rich man also died and was buried. There's a lot said right here in just, just this little short little verse. There's a lot to be said. The earthly funeral of the two men, let's look at it. They were radically different lifestyles. One lived very poor and wretched and had no friends and ultimately really not a very good life at all. And the other one lived in luxury beyond all imagination. As radically different were their lifestyles, so were their funerals. Radically different. The beggar, Lazarus, he dies first. That almost makes sense. He had the harder life. He had sores all over his body. He dies first. So we kind of get that. We say to ourselves, okay, he had deplorable conditions. I can see why. His only companions were these antagonizing dogs. He had no family, no friends that we're aware of, certainly none that would acknowledge that he actually exists. He had no funeral words were given whatsoever. And as far as we know, according to tradition, his body would have been thrown in the valley of Hinnon, ignored by all human beings, thrown out like a bunch of trash. And that was his funeral. Can you imagine having a funeral like that? Let's look at the rich man. His funeral would have been lavish. It would have been attended by his seven brothers, we're told, and the rest of his family. The eloquent words, think about this. How eloquent would the words be of his eulogies that would be given? They would be just stunning that he would have been given. The funeral of the two men were different. But we got thinking about it. And when you read this part of the story, you ask, where is the inequities? Why aren't those addressed? Where's the justice? Didn't seem to be any in the lifetime of either one of them. But when we start looking at their funerals and what happens next, we soon find out, hey, in the funeral there was no justice, but what happens next there certainly is. The beggar named Lazarus, like Enoch, was transported or or moved off to heaven. Elijah in the fiery chariot goes off to heaven. Now the angels arrive and we're told, most likely Gabriel or maybe even Michael arrives and they say, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to carry you. And can you imagine them carrying this beggar who smelled really bad? And maybe at this point he didn't, but he carried him off to Abraham's bosom. Talk about a funeral. His funeral wasn't very good as it started, but boy, did it ever finish fantastic. He was transported to a feast. He was an honored guest at Abraham's table. He was in heaven. He was in the presence of God. Now let's talk about the rich man. Couldn't be any more radically different. 
What would his rate the moment after he died? What would his life be like? In Jewish lore, it says this. The wicked will be carried away by the demons. The soul is cast into hell. We are told the second that he dies, not when his friends found out, not when the funeral happened, the second that he died, he went to hell. Anguish, torture, and desperations became his only friend. It's called an astrological reversal. The man who is rich became poor. The beggar becomes rich in the story. The justice of God is shown. Lazarus did, did not go to heaven because he was poor. And the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. It was the lifestyles that they chose. The inner attitude that we have towards God and the way we serve God actually does matter. And we want to tell the world about that. We don't want to just tell the world, oh, by the way, if you stand on grace and love and God's mercy, you're automatically going to heaven. We also want to tell them there is a forgiveness component here. You have to be sorry for your sins. You must make Jesus the Lord of your life. That's how you go to heaven. And it is by his grace and his mercy that you get there. But it's also through confession. You know what? The reality is is that uh, Lazarus, the Jews often gave you your name based on who you were. And Lazarus actually means God helped him. God didn't help him in his lifetime, I guess, from worldly standards, but God really did help him. God was with him every single time those dog licked his sores. Every single time that rich man came by and gave him not a single scrap from his table. God helped him survive that. He put his hope, his trust, and everything he had into God's holy word, into God himself, even though his life wasn't showing it. He still loved God. The rich man was a Pharisee, most likely. He valued what was highly detestable in God's sight, money. That was his attitude. And did he pay a price for it? The answer is yes, very much so. Let's reflect just for a moment. In the parable so far, both men died. All people will die. That's just a reality. Flesh and blood cannot get into the kingdom of God. So everybody's bodies are going to die eventually. Death has absolutely no partiality whatsoever, whether you're old or young, well or sick. Anyone can die tomorrow. Even if Christ comes before you die, your body is still going to perish. In this hour that I've been speaking for just a few moments, I know it's only been 10 or 15 minutes, but in every hour, approximately 6,400 people in this world will die. That's a reality. What will be said at your eulogy? Will the angels come and retrieve your soul? Or will torment, anguish, disparage, desperation be your only friends? You must choose now where you're going to go. Because if you don't choose God, you automatically go to hell. That's just a reality. Now I'm going to talk about hell. And I know it's not something that anybody really likes to talk about. But I think it's critical, especially when we talk to this world. They need to know hell exists. There's an awful lot of pressure out in society today, especially from the media, to say hell no longer exists, but it does. Let me tell you some characteristics about hell. First, hell is a real place. There are many misconceptions, I think, of hell out there. The atheists who don't believe in God say hell doesn't exist because God doesn't exist. Therefore, when I die, I just go to oblivion and I'm long gone. Some religious people, and it's growing in the number of people who actually believe this, they believe a loving God could never sentence anyone to an eternity of hell. Therefore, hell does not exist. The Jehovah's Witness mean that, believe that the wicked will be annihilated alone. They'll be gone. They won't exist anymore, and only the good people will go to heaven. The Mormons believe that all eventually will be saved. No eternal punishment's ever given. And the Seventh-day Adventists believe that God will blot out all sin and sinners and establish a brand new clean universe. But what does the Bible say? we got to go back to what the Bible says, because only the Bible contains the truth. If hell doesn't exist, then we don't need a Savior. We don't need Jesus Christ, and we never did need him to come and die on the cross, but as it is, we desperately need him. Psalms 9.17 says this, God and Jesus declare hell to be real. 162 references to hell, 70 come from Jesus alone. Jesus believed very much in hell. Because he created it. He created all things seen and unseen. He created it. 
Hell is not annihilation. It is a real place. It's called Gehenna. It's a real place of fiery judgment. Matthew 5, 22, 29, 30. It's a real place where recipients can see, feel, and hear everything. Hell does not change the fact that God loves the person, John 3, 16, and Romans 5, 8, but it does change the way you're going to live for your eternity. Gehenna is the abode of the wicked awaiting the judgment, and how the wicked, how wicked they are, they will be judged. Hell is also an immediate place. There's no pause between the end of your life and where you're going to go, either Abraham's bosom or hell. There is no pause in between that in this parable. The rich man closed his eyes in luxury with all that food that he had and all the comfort that he had and all the riches by his bedside. And when he woke up, he had none of that. Instead, he was in eternal torment. One second passed, the last heartbeat, and the second he died, he ended up in hell. Even before his family, some friends learned of his death, he was there. There is no in-between in this story then. There is no purgatory. There is no do-overs. God appoints a person once to die and then comes judgment. Hebrews 9.27. There's no time to repent. No time to say story. There's no time in which you get after you get into hell to say, Look, Lord, I'd like to have a better destination. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because you choose your place, heaven or hell, based on what you do while you're on this earth. So we are told in the parable, this rich man looks up and hell is very far away from heaven. And he saw Abraham very far away and Lazarus by his side. Hell is far away from God, very much so. Both Lazarus and the rich man are far away from each other. They're far away. They're waiting final judgment. And they are separated from each other. They live completely different lifestyles. And now they're in completely different destinations. The rich man looks up at Abraham. He sees him. And he sees Lazarus in his bosom far, far away. The damn might get a glimpse of heaven. But they're never going to be allowed to pass over into it. A great impasse, it says in Scripture, a gulf is there, a schism that is so big and so wide that they will never, ever be able to move over to heaven, nor can anybody from heaven come back over to hell. Not that they ever want to. Those in hell are far removed from God. They're removed from His smile. They're removed from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're removed from the blessings of the Holy Spirit because they chose their own path. They chose to go against God. And they're left with the truth. The wages of sin is death. They earned their position in hell. They earned it. They chose it. Whether they realized it or not, it was theirs for the taking. And they certainly did. They took it. They did. So the rich man calls out. And he says to him, hell is there. And he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Hell is an agonizing place. The rich man likely never gave his final destination any thought when he's living his life. I don't think very many people do. Sometimes at a funeral, yes, you certainly do. But other times in your life, do you really give it a second thought? I hope you do from time to time. But many people do not. He calls Abraham father in hope that he might be saved just because he called him Abraham. You're my dad. Surely I get to go to heaven. This is what the Pharisees ultimately believed anyway. He calls out to the beggar and he says to him, can you help me? Think about the irony. In his life, that beggar multiple times cried out in great agony and pain to the rich man and said, can you help me? Will you please help me? Give me a little bit of food. Help me in my agony. Share just a little bit of your wealth. You'll never see it. Gone. You got so much. What did the rich man do? He ignored him day in and day out. And this this passage drips with the irony because now it's the baker who has everything. And the rich man who has nothing. It's a rich man crying out to the beggar and saying, please, give me some water. Give me some water. Hell is a real place. It's a place of great agony. It's a real place that has unquenchable thirst. A real place of pain. 
It's a real place of frustration and anger. A real place of God's eternal wrath. A real place where worms eat you but you never die. Mark 9, 48. It is a place where you fear for the first time ever in your life the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. It is a real place. And we need to tell the world about it. I know it's tempting just to tell them about God's grace. That's important, by the way. Tell them about his mercy. But one cannot fully understand God's mercy without understanding where we're at, where we stand, how far we are between us and God. We've got to know that. We've got to tell the world, this is where you are. You can't get from here to where God is without saying yes to his son, Jesus. Tell them about that. Because I can tell you, hell is an agonizing place. And not in six years, 600 years, or six million years will this people, the people who go to hell, ever get out. The fire will never go out. The wailing and the gnashing of teeth will never stop. Hell is a real place with real fire. Real unspeakable pain like you've never felt before ever. It is real. No matter how many people might say otherwise. But Abraham replied to him, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received many good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comfort here and you are in agony. Hell is above all a place of eternal regrets. Abraham basically says, there's been a big reversal that's happened here in your life. While you were alive, you had absolutely everything. He said, you got all the good things in life. You had riches. You had fine linen for clothing. You had all the food you could ever imagine. You had this great big huge palace that you lived in, and this beggar had nothing, and you completely ignored him. You could have helped him, but you chose not to. Every single cry that you ignored the beggar. You ignored him when he asked for a scrap of food off of your table. You ignored him when he said, please call me. You ignored him when he said, I need some medical attention. You ignored him. You ignored God all your life as well. You ignored him. Hell is a place filled with regrets. Longing for love and relationship, but none's going to happen. Hell is not an automatic reversal of life. It's not. Just because you're rich doesn't mean that you're automatically going to go to hell, nor does it mean if you're poor, you're going to heaven. What it does mean, this parable says, what you sow, you shall reap. Either you love God and you have a relationship with him and go to heaven, or you don't love him and you go to hell. This is what the parable's saying. This is the warning. You will be in torment and anguish. You will remember every sin that you ever did that earned you your position in hell in that agony. Every presentation of the gospel message, every one of them, every one that you said no to, or maybe later I might make a decision for you, God, every single one of them are going to haunt you for an eternity. And even this sermon will haunt you forever, which certainly is not my intent. My intent is hopefully you will get saved so you don't have to go there. In the parable, Jesus goes on, he says, and besides all this, between us and you, a great schism has been put in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Hell is an inescapable place. I remember watching a movie. It was about an escape from prison. It's about this guy who was very good at escaping from any prison that you ever put him in. And it's how he actually got out. And I got thinking, you know what? Hell's not like that. Hell is a place in which God places you in it and you will not get out. It is not purgatory. It's not a place that you spend some time in and once you do enough good deeds, you get to go to heaven. Or somebody pays enough money, you get there. That's not what it is. Hell is inescapable. Once you are there, you cannot, no matter what you do, get out. You'll have no opportunities to repent. No opportunities to change your mind. You cannot change your circumstances. You rejected God's revelation. You rejected it. You saw all the creation that testified God's existence and you looked at it and you rejected it. You looked at his holy word and you thought it was foolishness. You rejected it. You looked at the testimonies of countless saints and you rejected that testimony. You chose hell. It's what you're always going to remember while you can't get out of it. It's a great schism, Jesus says. Mountainous cavernous and, and deep pits. It's going to be like a wall guarded by the angels. You cannot breach God's judgment. 
You cannot get out because God put you there. It cannot be done. There's no parole. There's no appeal to a higher court. Nobody's going to rescue you. You're not going to see the cavalry come up and say, hey, I want to take you away. That's not happening. There'll be no reincarnation. There'll be no escape from hell. Once you are there, you stay there forever. Your hope and your expectations will have completely die. And no matter how much you might wish, you cannot save your family and friends, and you cannot visit them either. Because once you're in hell, you stay in hell. You stay there, and you do. He answered, and this is the rich man. He says, and I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him mourn them, so they will not come also to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if somebody from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if somebody from the dead was to go visit them. Hell is above all a desperate place. Even while living in his mansion, enjoying his wealth, he probably gave no attention thought whatsoever to the idea of where he was going when he was going to die. Now it's the only thing he can think of. The rich man, he was rich. He believed as the Pharisees did. He believed in money and fame and power, and he believed that if he pretended to be religious or righteous in God's sight, that would get him to heaven. But that that is not what we need to tell the world. And I implore you as Christians, don't tell the world just about God's grace and forget the judgment. Don't do that. Because they'll stand on cheap grace every time. And they'll say, I know I'm going to heaven because, hey, the Bible told me so. The Bible said if I just acknowledge Jesus, I get to go to heaven. You must make him the Lord of your life. You must. Or you don't go to heaven. You must. The rich man said, I have such great concern for my brothers and and their families. I don't want them to come here. And Abraham says, you know what? I understand you want to give them another chance but I gave you a lifetime of chances and it made no difference for you. It will make no difference for them. Ironically, and I think it's dripping with irony, Jesus actually did raise a man named Lazarus from the dead and it made no effect on the Pharisees whatsoever. They still didn't believe in Jesus. Had the rich man heeded the word of God, he would have taken care of the beggar and he would have said to God, I want to bow my knee to Lord Jesus Christ because I want to be saved. But he didn't believe that. One more miracle will not change your mind. The only thing that's going to change your mind is complete and utter submission to Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. William Booth, he was the founder of the Salvation Army. He says this, I would that my workers would spend a weekend in hell and and if they could only hear the shouts and the groans and smell the burning flash, they would come back and they would preach with far greater enthusiasm so let me ask you in closing what is your response to God death is not a subject we like to talk about but it is a guarantee and every time we go to funeral it forces us to remember what is going to happen to us the moment that we die God's intent ultimately is for each and every one of us that he created us of the dust of the earth he created us in his image he wants to know us He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to obey him. He wants us to submit to him as our creator. You know, the reality is is the world's response usually to God, I think, is they give no thought whatsoever on how they live their lives. They think they can live it any way they want, and they'll either get to heaven or they'll be completely annihilated and they won't have to worry about it. But the testimony of God's word says otherwise. God's response to us, to each and every one of us, What you do while in the body on this earth matters. In other words, what you do here determines your eternity later. So choose wisely. It's either heaven or it is hell. Choose your place. Hell is a real place. Hell is far from heaven. It's filled with agony, regrets, desperation, knowing there's no escape possible. The eternal fire will lick at your flesh. Torment will be unbearable. And forever you'll wish you had been annihilated but you won't have been annihilated at all, and the worms will continue to eat at your flesh. To the believers, I implore you, don't just tell them about God's grace. Tell them that God's just too. 
Make sure they get a balanced perspective. Make sure they know and understand they choose their destination because Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the price for their choice. So have them. Tell them. Choose before it's too late. Tell them about hell. I know most of the world doesn't believe in it anymore, but it's still a real place. Tell them. There's a great schism. And the second they get thrown in hell after they die, they're never getting out. They're never going to have another chance. So make that decision now. And to the unbelievers, I say this. This is your time. This is your time. Don't reject them anymore. Bow your knee to them. Tell him that you want to pass over from death to life. See Christ hanging upon that cross who paid the price for you to make the choice in the first place, see him and realize that he is a loving, kind, gracious, and merciful God, but he's also a just one. Make a decision for him. Surrender your life to him. Tell him you're sorry for your sins and invite him in. Don't let this sermon haunt you forever. Because that's not what I want. What I want is the same as my Father in heaven wants. For you to get saved. God the Father in heaven said, I wish nobody should perish. I have the same feeling in my heart too, even though I know many will. So out of fear, but more importantly love, accept God's gracious gift of salvation before it's too late. And then your destiny will be hell. And you will not escape. And I pray that doesn't happen to you. I can say this was a hard sermon to give because... It's not filled with grace and mercy. And and that wasn't Jesus' focus to the Pharisee at all. His focus was to warn him of his destiny. I hope if you're not saved, you hear the warning. And you choose heaven over hell. May God bless you today in this sermon. Amen.